Good morning, I'm Kim Heath, the Senior Retail Insight Manager here at AHDB, and welcome to the first of two webinars by the Retail and Consumer Insight team. If you are new to what our team do, we're here to help levy payers and others in the industry understand what is going on in terms of consumer behaviour in the food market, and more specifically for meat and dairy. Um, this time last year, when I was sitting here talking to some of you, we were fairly positive. We were talking about behaviours as we came out the other side of the COVID pandemic. Um, little did we know the next hurdle we would face in 2022, which is the main topic of today's webinar, which is the impact of the cost of living crisis. Um, before we start, I just want to cover some housekeeping points. Um, we'll aim to finish before 11.30 with the agenda being 45 minutes from us and then 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. All participants will be on mute throughout, but questions can be asked by typing in the questions box, which you'll be able to see on the right hand side. Um, if you can't see it, there's um, an orange arrow that expands the taskbar, and then there's a white arrow to open the question box um, where you can type them in. And please feel free to do this during the presentation. Um, the session is being recorded and will be hosted on our website after in case you want to play anything back or pass on the recording to someone else. Um, and a copy of the presentation slides will be available for all participants after the session if they complete um, a quick two minute feedback form. Um, so it's really important that you fill this in if you want to receive um, a hard copy of the slides. Um, and I suppose this would be a good, a good point to introduce our speakers for today. So we have Rebecca Gladman and Grace Randall, who are both Retail Insight Managers in the team. Rebecca is going to start by talking to you about demand, and then Grace is going to take you through how that impacts usage of the categories. Um, we're then going to hand over to Nicola Dodd, who is Senior Marketing Manager here at AHDB, and she is going to highlight some of the upcoming value-led marketing campaigns and how the industry can get involved. And this will then lead into the Q&A. So before I hand over, I just want to set the backdrop for today. Consumer confidence, so consumer views of the current and future economy and their finances, in September fell to its lowest level since records began in 1974. Consumers are concerned about energy bills, mortgage rates, inflation, um, and specifically for food, which is un understandable as we see on the right hand side, the average price for food and drink in retail is up 9% year on year and food service up 20% versus pre-COVID. This results in 59% of consumers claim claiming to be worse off financially, impacting what people are buying, um, with 29% claiming to be spending less on grocery and 40% less at pubs and restaurants. And we can see the impact of all of this on the retail and food service markets, with value growth in the last 12 weeks to September being purely driven by, by price as volumes are suffering massively. So how do consumers respond? If we look at what is driving value down in the retail FMCG market, despite just saying that value is up overall due to price, we see ways consumers are trying to mitigate that price rise. Um, the biggest way is by changing what products within a category they buy, which contributes to 38% 38% of spend declines, followed by buying less, then trading down within tiers, followed by seeking out more deals, and lastly by trading down stores, which contributes the least at 7% of declines. We also need to consider the impact this has on what and how consumers are cooking at home, and the impact on the food service market, which was already struggling with the post-COVID recovery. We know consumers had settled into a kind of new normal, which meant that out of home occasions were approximately 10% smaller than pre-COVID anyway, due to consumers choosing to work and socialise more at home. So adding the cost of living crisis on top of this is a massive blow for the out of home market. So specifically, how does this play out for meat and dairy? I'll now hand over to Rebecca Gladman. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, so Kim has just set the scene there as to what people are doing now to cope with these increasing prices. So what we wanted to do is just take a bit of a look back and see how this compares to the 2008-09 recession. And actually, the behaviours are very typical. So data we have here from Kantar shows that when um, things that first hit in in 2008, people started trading down their product choice, and this is in the blue. They also opted for more promotions and deals, and this is in the red in the chart, driving value out of the market. 
And also we saw people trade down stores um, to the discounters in particular, leading to their growth at this stage. More recently in our tracker, we wanted to find out how much of a conscious decision this was with our consumers. And actually it is very top of mind to them. The majority of people are looking for things like trading down from branded to own label within the tiers as well, buy more and promotions and shopping at cheaper stores. So it's a very conscious decision. And we'll look at each of these buckets in more detail in this section. So firstly, that movement down between tiers, either within private label or from brands to private label itself. And to illustrate this, we have the performance of cheese on the left hand side. So within cheese, brands for account for just over a quarter of all volumes. But this share has actually dropped by just over three percentage points versus a year ago, owing to the performance that we see on the chart here, with brands down 13% in volumes and private label up 2%. Within dairy, yogurt is also a very heavily branded category, um, accounting for just over 58% of volumes. And we see a similar trend here with brands declining faster than private label. For meat, there is a relatively low instance of brands, with the exception of some categories such as sausages, um, which means that we see more movement within private label. And actually in our tracker, um, we asked people how important quality tier has become to them. And 19% of meat shoppers said that quality tier had become less important to them than previously. And this was up from 4% a year ago. And we can see this kind of playing out here with the value private label tier up 24%, standard private label down 7%. And in addition to, the, to this, premium private label volumes down 5%. Within this value private label, uh, primary beef products in particular are doing really well, particularly steaks and mints, uh, which showing that people will, will trade into 20% fat mints away from the leaner option at the right price. So another way people are mitigating costs, as Kim showed, is that movement within category. So here we have switching between proteins within meat, fish and poultry. And the movements here in the blue arrows are going into pig meat, and the yellow arrows going into chicken, away from the more expensive proteins like beef, lamb and fish. So with beef being 20% more expensive than, on average than pig meat and lamb 56% 56, 56 more expensive than pig meat, we can see here some of the savings that consumers can make just by switching between the proteins. Within dairy, we are starting to see some slight losses to margarine and plant-based spreads away from block butter. Uh, we can see here that the price differential between block butter and margarine has elevated recently, um, despite obviously some of the input costs for margarine in, in terms of oils um, increasing as well. So research from Mintel does show that spreads are more likely to be used in things like sandwiches and on toast, but consumers also see um, block butter as uh, easy to substitute with margarine within baking, which is something you'd think is maybe more of a heartland for block butter. So this creates a bit of a risk for block butter as shoppers look to trade down and also potentially cut items from their basket altogether. So trading down stores is another option that people are, um, are finding to mitigate some of those costs. And this is where Aldi and Lidl did particularly well um, from 2008 onwards. And we can see here in the chart the difference in their market shares versus 14 years ago. So the market is very different to, um, to, to this last period that we see here. And we know that people are flocking to um, the discounters as shown in this headline here. And recent Kantar data showed that Aldi had um, become the fourth largest grocer in Great Britain, um, overtaking Morrison's. But actually, in some categories, such as meat, the discounters have been um, punching above their weight for quite some time. And when we look specifically at which categories they over and under trade in, we can see the ones that are likely to benefit and those that might lose out. So the ones that might benefit from any movement to the discounters are pig meat, butter, yogurt and cheese. But actually the risk areas are within lamb, ready meals, pies and also milk. But looking specifically at the specialist retailers for milk and meat, uh, which is the milkman and butchers, we can see here the difference in fortune for these specialist retailers. 
So milkman share of uh, cow's milk volumes we can see in the blue line here has been steadily increasing since the start of the pandemic. And when we ask consumers in our tracker why this is, it's pr primarily linked to the convenience of the doorstep delivery. But there might be an element of that sort of more subscription model and potentially even sustainability um, driving some of the options here. So on the flip side, butchers in the green in this line here has been have been declining share of volume within meat. Um, and we know that we gained a lot of shoppers at the start of the pandemic and these haven't been retained. So butchers could potentially take inspiration from milkman performance, perhaps something like a subscription model or upping sustainability credentials via reduced plastic packaging. But while there are different performances for milkmen and butchers, both milk from the milkmen and meat from butchers are more expensive than the market average, as shown on the right here, which could put them at risk as, as shoppers look to save money and trade down retailers. Promotions were another way that people are looking to save money with around 60% of respondents to our tracker saying they're currently using promotions to save money on food and grocery shopping. However, promotions have been in longer term decline uh, in response to this longer term movement towards everyday low pricing strategies from the retailers. And we can see this illustrated by some of the key dairy and meat categories here. Pork sausages on the right are one of the most promoted categories within meat. And despite 34% of volume going through through a promotion in the latest 12 week period, this is down nearly six percentage points versus five years ago. In addition to this, we can see the third bar from the left, um, the volume of cheese sold in promotion, and this has been on steady year on year decline. And versus five years ago, the volume sold on promotion now is 12 points lower. However, we've also seen an increase in the use of loyalty schemes recently, as people believe this will help them save money. So IGD data shows that Tesco is obviously the most established loyalty scheme with just under 80% of British shoppers signed up to it and around three quarters of those using it on a, uh, within the past month. And there's also more in the market now. So things like Little Plus weren't a thing back in uh, the last recession. Uh, Asda Rewards is also just sort of starting now. And people do believe these loyalty schemes will save them money. So for our categories, it's important to think about targeted promotions to individual consumers via these options. So while we're seeing category promotions in decline over the years, there is value to be offered um, across categories and across retail. So a good example that sprung up in the last recession was the dine-in nights, and these have definitely elevated recently. Kim mentioned earlier that around the, the fact that people will be eating out less than usual, and it's about offering these consumers the opportunity to create that occasion at home. So in October next year, the current plan is for volume driving promotions on high fat, salt and sugar products uh, will be restricted. However, the current guidance is that these sort of meal deals won't be included in that, as so they can still highlight the value to shoppers should that legislation still go ahead. But this does propose a bit of a risk to the food service market. We see here in the chart that people saying they will not visit pubs and restaurants over the next month has increased rapidly versus last year and is almost to the same levels as when August 2020 when people were really worried um, started heading out after the initial lockdowns. So in IGD, IG, uh, in July, IGD asked shoppers how they will be managing their spend out of home and the top option people uh, selected was that they will look for vouchers and deals to save money with just under half opting for this ahead of skipping a dessert, a, a dessert or a starter or opting for a cheaper main meal. And we have examples here from across different channels within food service. So traditional pub restaurant dining, uh, the Hungry Horse chain here offering a pound meal option for uh, families. And also we must remember that the competitive set within the out of home market does include grocery retail. Um, and the example here is from the club card uh, three pound meal deal. And we've just touched on now the, the strength of the club card and how many consumers have this. So all consumers are struggling and finding ways to save money. And at a total level, 55% of British adults feel that food shopping is not very or not at all affordable. And this feeling is evident across many demographics, although families with children and those in lower social grade households are more likely to find the prices completely unaffordable. And these houses in particular are planning ahead. 
So those with children at home are looking for ways to save now in preparation for Christmas, with just under half of these households saying they spent less during summer 2022 in order to save for Christmas compared to just 21% of those without children. So starting promotions early will help these households to spread the cost. Within dairy, cutbacks made by those with children in the household could have a greater impact on the cheese category as they account for a higher share of this category than they do of total households. So this is even more pronounced for cheeses such as uh, within snacking and lunchbox cheeses, but also mild cheddar where households with children account for just under half of volume. And for meat, we know that the lower social grade households are more likely to buy things like burgers and frozen meat. So we expect them to stick with these categories, but perhaps trade down within them. So from brands to private label, for example. More affluent shoppers could start dropping higher ticket items such as ready to cook and also lamb could be at risk here. So regardless of household prof profile, cost is a big driver for all shoppers and we've seen a massive uplift in those claiming expense as a driver of meat and dairy reduction as shown here. With those saying that those that have eaten less meat, um, majority of those saying that this is because it's become more expensive and this is up 33 percentage points year on year. And within dairy, 26% of those redu considering reducing dairy say it's because of the cost and this is up 20 points year on year. So massive increases. And as price and expense have increased in importance, health and environment as drivers of meat reduction have eased more recently. So this doesn't mean to say that these issues are no longer important, that's definitely not the case, and we'll explore these themes more in the second webinar next week on the 20th. So how do all these factors net out for top line meat and dairy performance? So Kim showed us at the start of this presentation that total food and drink volumes within retail were down 4% versus 2021 and 7% versus 2019. So we're seeing here how meat and dairy line up. Categories that are hardest hit within meat are is lamb and butter within dairy. However, there are positives here in the long term with cheese and cream in both in growth when compared to pre-COVID and pig meat and chicken in line with pre-COVID volumes. Just to mention that this is obviously very top line and we have more detailed data on our website. The link to this is at the bottom of the slide, so you can look at specific timeframes, cuts and products. And there are still opportunities to mix all of this within people's consumption behaviours, as Grace will take you through now. Thanks, Nick. I'll just share my screen. Perfect. So as Beck said, um, she's taking you through um, what's currently happening in the retail market. And now we're going to look at some consumption trends. So currently, trends in consumption are still much more impacted by the changes to our lifestyle as a result of the pandemic than they are from the cost of living crisis. So we're still seeing much more consumption at home up 7% um, compared to pre-pandemic, the equivalent of an extra 1.1 billion occasions in the last quarter. The UK is still working from home much more than other countries, and one in five still expect to work more than half of their time from home. And because of this, we're still seeing occasion, uh, lunch occasions up 8.3% versus pre-COVID, but the largest increase in occasions is for snacks. And while we're um, eating while we work, we've had an extra 373 million occasions in the last year in front of laptops and computers. So these are really changing the types of meals that we're eating. And because of these changes in in-home habits, we've been eating earlier. Lunches have been increasingly eaten between 12 and 1 p.m. And we're also seeing an uplift in um, evening meals eaten between 5 and 7 p.m. Although there are no restrictions on having guests, we are still socialising less than we were before COVID. 58% of main meals I've had with just one or two people present. And this does mean that we're eating more meals in front of the TV, an extra 530 million occasions versus pre-COVID. 
but we're also having more romantic and more special meals at home as well as we continue to have these meals in home rather than perhaps opting to go out to eat because of that cost element and also because um, of still that trepidation because of COVID. So there are opportunities for those big night in promotions that Beck discussed earlier. So how are all of these factors impacting what we eat? While we saw in retail that shoppers were trading down tiers, trading products and stores, all in a bid to save money, at the moment their purchases are still ending up making the same dishes. Whether they're buying organic lamb mince and parmesan from a premium retailer or value pork mince and cheddar, people are turning those still into the same dishes. And why are we doing this? Because we're creatures of habit. We know the foods that we like and the ones that we're confident in making. However, we are increasingly seeing a number choosing the meals that they eat because they don't cost too much. This is from our tracker. Um, so we may dial up those preferred cheap meals and restrict those pricier favourites. Shoppers may also look for new dishes and ways to save money. So new recipes should focus on good value, as well as meeting those other key consumer needs such as taste and ease. And although we aren't currently seeing large impacts of, of the cost of living crisis, shoppers are thinking about ways to save money. So we think that there are some changes that could be on the horizon. From the last recession, we know that when times are tough, um, people look for smaller treats and indulgences. This is sometimes called the lipstick effect. In 2008, this was particularly benefited biscuits, and we have already seen this start to come through from the lower consumer confidence that we've seen during the pandemic. And at-home snacking is still significantly up on pre-pandemic levels. However, with the changes in our routines and lifestyles, we've seen consumers dropping the indulgence of desserts after the evening meal, instead opting for a later evening snack. This means the types of treats that shoppers are buying is different, with cakes and cream desserts being dropped in favour of confectionery. What, this does, what does this mean for meat and dairy? Um, so there's opportunities for meat to gain from the growth in snacks by promoting meat-based options. And for dairy, it's reminding consumers that desserts can be eaten as a late night snack, um, not just straight after the main meal as a dessert. Other dairy items could also market themselves as great for snacks, such as ice creams, cheese and yogurts, as a healthier alternative to biscuits. Another area of um, change has been in-home lunches, and these have been heavily influenced by the pandemic. Um, carried out lunch dropped as we spent more time at home, and it's still 23% smaller than pre-pandemic, but it is recovering extremely quickly. And we think that even if people don't return to the office full time, when they do go into the office, they may, we may expect them to take um, food from home rather than grabbing a meal deal in a bid to save money. And we're also seeing kids returning to schools um, and this is seeing an increase in those lunch boxes as well. And this is not just true for lunches, but also for snacks. We're seeing people taking in more treats from home to work and school rather than relying on vending machines. In-home consumption, um, is um, being impacted by the cost of living crisis. As energy costs rise, we're already seeing a small number opting for cold lunches over hot, and the reason for this because of the cost of energy. If others um, see this as a need, if we see this get worse, then we could see um, continued growth in sandwiches and salads, or meals which require less energy, such as toast. So what are the opportunities? Meat may look to benefit from this increase in lunch boxes, Ham sandwiches are an absolute favourite at lunchtime, far and away the biggest um, option that we choose. And because of this, um, pork sliced cooked meats are one of the few cuts which are in volume growth versus 2019. Red meat should also consider other cold products which could work with or in sandwiches and salads, such as corned beef slices, but also ready to eat products. For dairy, cheese sandwiches are the second most popular meal at lunchtime. And with all these sandwiches, butter and spreads are likely to see some uplift. Cheese, as well as yogurt, should also consider snacking options as these are growing in popularity in lunch boxes. Shoppers are scaling back on coffees out of home, even on last year, so reminding consumers of the good value of hot drinks in home could be a boost for milk. At the moment, scratch cooking is fairly stagnant, um, remaining at 11.2% of meals over the last two years. 
what we have seen is actually a growth in convenience cooking. Um, and this rise is because consumers felt uh, cooking fatigue during the pandemic. But as convenience meals often come at a much higher price, um, that premium, um, we expect to see um, some shoppers switch back to cheaper scratch cooking methods. Reducing food waste is the most popular way that shoppers are looking to save money in home, with half of struggling households considering this as a way to save money in the future. Batch cooking is an, also an option for consumers, especially those who are worried about appliance use. Cooking large meals in the oven, um, several at once, um, could be an option um, for those who are looking to be more efficient with their um, uh, cost of energy. Linked to this, as we saw from Beck earlier, um, those that are reducing their meat consumption, cost is now the biggest reason why, up 33 percentage points. In general, we have seen consumers scaling back on the number of ingredients that they're using in meals, uh, with two thirds of evening meals containing six or fewer items. Meat is an important part of many meals, but evening meals with meat are considerably more expensive than those without, so we could see meat being one of the ingredients dropped from dishes. But what can we do to combat this? Consumers are increasingly looking for meals to be filling and easy. So we need to dial up these messages on how meat and dairy can meet these needs to keep um, them as an integral part of consumers' cooking repertoires. Indian, roasts and Italian are some of the top meals cooked from scratch. Red meat is likely to benefit most from an increase in roast dinners. So we can remind shoppers of how versatile roasting joints are. They're great for the roast, but then also leftovers and sandwiches. And for pork and lamb, roasting joints can be a really cost effective as they have a lower price per kilogram than many other primary cuts within those proteins. Um, also, that increase in easy and filling needs, the roasts are really good here, um, but also innovate with other recipes which can meet these needs and which can be batch cooked. Food waste is a huge concern, so highlighting how best to store products, and we think that freezeability instructions might become increasingly important to consumers. For dairy, as these tend not to be the main focus of a dish, it's about reminding shoppers of the great taste of dairy and how easy it can be to add dairy to boost flavour. Um, and this is still the main need for consumers. Highlighting where dairy can be the main focus of the meal as well, such as soups or sandwiches, and also with cooking cheeses, which we've seen grow in popularity, things like halloumi and paneer. As with meat, reducing food waste is a key need, so highlighting packaging innovations which can keep food fresher for longer. Moving away from in-home consumption and looking at the food service market, we see people move towards cheaper meals. Burgers, breakfasts and savoury pastries have all seen growth in trips on last year and all have a relatively low price point. So they've all come in at under five pounds for the average meal. In terms of those areas which are losing, um, side dishes have seen the biggest loss in food service. It's an easy way to make your meal cheaper by cutting the number of sides that you have. Meat centered meals such as steak and chips, roast dinners and shepherd's pie have also seen big losses um, as they tend to have a higher price point. Uh, we've also seen sandwiches in decline. So despite being a relatively cheap option, um, this is where we're seeing that impact of people going to the office less um, and taking in more, and it, when they do taking in more lunch boxes and we can see that impact in here. If we look at which channels are in value growth in food service compared to pre-COVID, and we see that those cheaper quick food service uh, restaurants and coffee shops are performing the best, and the treatier higher end food service restaurants um, and pubs also seeing growth. So what um, we're seeing is that squeezed middle ground, um, such as the major multiples and sandwich and bakery. And we're also seeing work and education still considerably below pre-COVID levels. But value growth in all areas is coming through from an increase in average price, except for quick service restaurants, which do see an increase in trips compared to pre-COVID. And this is generally through takeaways. When we look at the time of day that we're eating out, morning and afternoon are seeing a drop in share while evening meals are gaining, showing that when we do choose to go and eat out or get a takeaway, we're looking for that more special occasion meal rather than a quick lunch. Promotion of meat and dairy during big events is always a great opportunity. This Christmas may be another unique one for us. Um, on the positive side, it's the first Christmas without restrictions or mass trepidation since 2019. 
Um, but last year, research from IGD showed that 32% said the news of Omicron impacted their celebrations in some way, and 44% celebrated fewer, with fewer people than they usually would. Um, so we think people may want to make up with this, uh, for this this Christmas um, by having larger celebrations. We also have the World Cup this year. It's in a different season to usual, ending just before Christmas. We think that most people will continue to cook meals as usual, but around a third say they will order takeaway and 28% will have family or friends around to watch on match days. So there could be opportunities here. At the moment, Easter is a pretty unpredictable one, um, but with lamb at such a high price point, um, it will have to work really hard to defend its share this Easter. There could be opportunities for other proteins to gain here, but obviously across all of these events, um, there are limitations based on where we go with the cost of living crisis. Across all occasions, but particularly Christmas, as Beck mentioned earlier, going early with promotions will help those shoppers who are looking to spread their spend. In summary, um, some households are impacted by the cost of living crisis more than others, and this is also the case with categories which will all be impacted differently. So I know today we've um, done a very top line overview, um, but you can go to the dashboards on our website if you have more specific questions. Um, but then also if you have uh, further questions about your category or your retailer, then please do get in touch. We are seeing a return in those recessionary behaviours, which is to be expected. Um, at the moment, we're seeing trends in total grocery also play out in meat and dairy, such as the trading down and the changing product mix. But therefore, having a really good value offering is increasingly important and in ensuring that tiering is clear for those who are looking for the cheapest products. But for those that aren't, highlighting products which are really good value for money and how shoppers can make those products go further could be really important. Promotions continue to be a driver of shopper decisions, both in retail and in food service. As shoppers may wish to spread the cost this holiday season, as we said, starting promotions early could really help with this. In home, snacking has um, increased and shoppers turn to those small treats. So consider how meat and dairy can meet the needs of shoppers which are looking for easy and healthy snacks. And as consumers look to save money and may turn towards cooking meals from scratch, information on how to make the most of meat and dairy could be really useful for shoppers. Meal inspiration needs to meet consumer needs for being filling and really easy, as well as most importantly, being tasty. So now I'm gonna hand over to Nicola from our marketing team um, to see how AHTB are using these insights in their latest campaigns. Hi. Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, I'm Nicola Dodd, Senior Marketing Manager for Pork at AHDB, and I just wanted to take a few moments to talk you through some of the exciting marketing activities that um, we're, we're doing at the moment. So really, the role of marketing is all about adding value back to your businesses and to maintain volume. So we work closely with the marketing intelligence team to look at the data um, that they pull and, and work together to identify trends and opportunities and then to match those opportunities by developing marketing activities um, to respond to those and working with supply, ch supply chain throughout. Now, our focus tends to be around the long term opportunities. So where we see it being in terms of the space of health, um, environment and welfare. But we're, um, and actually, my um, colleague Carrie will um, go on and tell you a bit about the campaign work we're going to be doing in next week's um, webinar. But we also need to be very agile and respond to market um, changes. And so obviously, um, in line with the topic of this um, webinar, the cost of living crisis is impacting so many people. So we really need to make sure that um, we're responding to those um, market changes and create some short term campaigns that, that um, meet the needs of these um, consumers. So we're looking to. Um, um, sorry, Grace, please. Next slide. So it's exciting to say that actually on Monday, we've got a brand new campaign coming out for pork, which is um, really around the sort of affordability messages around um, cost of living. And the strap line is feed the family for less with pork. So we're using it as a, as a, um, a platform to really demonstrate not only the taste and versatility of pork, but also that it's a really cost effective um, food choice. 
So we're reaching out um, to families predominantly with the aim to really raise awareness and um, drive consideration of pork being a great value, tasty midweek meal op opportunity, but also the fact that this sort of affordability is the number one message. So the, the, the focus for the campaign is around the more affordable cuts. So um, we're focusing on the pork shoulder, um, lean mints, and also pork sausages. Next slide, please, Grace. So as you'll see from this slide, there's lots of lovely um, recipe imagery that's really there to sort of inspire people um, to to inform them about the different dishes that you can create with pork but all of this is very much underpinned by these affordability value messages so this feed the family for less with pork so the new recipes that we have developed are very much with value in mind so we've um, we've created recipes that not only um, are tasty and, and enticing but also very conscious about using minimum ingredients store cupboard ingredients where possible but also that um, you can feed a family of uh, four for five pounds so um, really tapping into this sort of affordability area and we're going to be putting our um, adverts, you'll see them across a number of different channels. So we'll be on the Catch Up TV, on ITV, uh, Channel 4 and Sky. Um, you'll see them on YouTube and then also across um, a variety of social media channels. So there is a, a combination of um, static recipes, recipe videos and then um, the short um, um, advert um, that you've just seen there in terms of it's just a six second advert but really it sort of draw, captures people's attention and then provides key messaging and then um, and then links through to the website there you go quickly played again uh, links through to the Loveport website where there's um, lots more budget friendly recipes and we can demonstrate the versatility of pork in those places. And um, really across all those different channels, we, we're trying to reach as many people as possible. So we're expecting um, these, these uh, messages to be um, out at 26, 26 million opportunities to see these, um, these messages and these adverts and um, hoping to uh, establish 4.7 million um, video views of the content. Um, so we, we're looking at um, reaching a wide number of people with some really, really motivating messages. Next slide, please, Grace. And this message, messaging continues through into the sort of the stores and online. So to give people that sort of nudge at the point of purchase. So we're working um, alongside these retailers who are really supportive in, in getting this messaging across. So you can see here, there's some examples of the mock-ups of um, some of the signages that we got, um, both in-store and online. So we've got um, some lovely shelf markers, um, aisle fins, um, some stickers on packs, and then um, online banners as well, driving people um, through to, to um, look at the, the different products of pork. And also we've, we've been a bit more sophisticated now in terms of the actual um, point of sale that we're using. So people are a bit more afe with QR codes now through after COVID. So we've, um, we've featured those across the point of sale so that people can scan there and then be linked back through to the, the website to find out more budget friendly recipes as well. So um, it sort of gives them the nudge and then gives them the, the sort of solution and demonstrates um, versatility of pork. And then it's not just about sort of the six week campaign period that we run. We're really focusing on these affordability messages throughout the year um, in our always on work. So, um, like I said, we've, we've got lots of new recipes. We've established some new um, collection pages on the website. And then, like um, Grace had said, in terms of adding value in other ways. So we've got some new blogs on um, batch cooking and money saving tips, using leftovers to so really sort of adding value to people in that sense. Each week we have lots of fresh um, recipe content and messages to really inspire people and demonstrate versatility of pork. And we're also working with a number of influencers really to sort of help us spread our messages, um, create new engaging content that's sort of trusted um, by their followers and a, and a great way of um, um, reaching out and, and, and creating some new content. And this affordability focus is not just in um, working in pork, but we're, we're, we're doing the same sort of things across the other sectors as well. So um, as both Beck and Grace said, the sort of 
the the move to having a bigger occasions at home so rather than eating out quite so much um, people are looking to sort of create some nice tasty meals um, at home uh, for special occasions so whether it's sort of a date night in whether you were creating some fakeaways instead of the takeaway on a Friday night or having some mates over and, um, and cooking for them so we've got um, lots of different recipe inspiration on the website on social and again we're working with influencers in that um, to create some good cost um, cost effective meals as well and then for dairy there's been a, a recent study um, into affordable nutrition and um, I think we're probably aware that in general, healthier diets tend to be more costly than, than the less healthy ones. But it's really great that dairy has come out and been identified as a really um, great nutrient dense product, yet is affordable. So we're really trying to um, shout about that and, and um, create some assets and PR around that to, to raise, raise awareness of how important dairy is um, within, um, within people's diets. So as I said, we've got lots going on um, for the campaign, but then always on as well. So um, it would be really lovely if we can get your support by, um, by you sharing our content. We've got um, Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest sites for both Simply Beef and Lamb and Love Pork. Um, they're listed here and it'd be great if you could um, visit the social channels, like, comment, and as I said, share any con content. And if you have any content that you create yourselves, please tag us in with the hashtags. Um, and it's a great way of spreading the, the word further. And as I said, we have got um, other campaigns that we're um, busy working on um, at the same time. And Carrie, my colleague, will um, go through some of the We Balance work that we're going through um, at next week's webinar. So I'll just quickly hand back to Kim for a summary and any questions. Great. Thank you very much to all our speakers for that great presentation. Um, a lot to cover in a short space of time, but fantastic insights for the industry. And as um, Beck and Grace mentioned, obviously, in such a short space of time, we can only cover kind of like top level for all the categories um, within meat and dairy. So if you do have any specific questions, then please feel free to approach us or look at what's available um, on, on our website. So before moving on to the q and um, I just wanted to remind you all to sign up if you haven't already to the second in our series of webinars. This is on the 20th of October, where we look at how the cost of living crisis has impacted consumer attitudes and trust towards the industry, um, covering hot topics such as health, provenance, the environment, animal welfare. Um, the webinar sign up is available on our website and also you can sign up um, there as well to our team bi-monthly newsletter which informs you of what articles and reports have been released in the recent weeks. Um, and finally just a reminder to fill in the feedback form if you would like a copy of the slides um, as we really appreciate hearing your thoughts. So um, let's move on to some questions um, and just to flag if we don't cover your question now don't worry worry we will be answering them via email um, afterwards. So um, the first question that has come in yeah if I ask everyone if they want to come back on um, back onto their cameras um, I think I will hand over to you um, Rebecca because it's about demand um, and someone's just asking for a bit of context of how um, meat alternatives are performing um, compared to, to, to meat. Yeah, so um, year on year, these sorts of products are very in line with the total food and drink performance. So you showed up front, Kim, that total food and drink volumes were down 4%, I think it was. And our meat alternatives are down 7% year on year. And actually, just to bring in dairy alternatives, they're down 3% year on year. So very in line. It's that longer term trend that's different. So um, they are up, both of them, nearly 30% versus 2019. But I think the context here is still the scale of them. Whilst you've got these big figures, double digit, they are still very small compared to your, your animal, dairy and meat. So, um, for example, alternatives within total dairy and just milk alternatives around 5% of the size of animal dairy. Um, and within meat, meat alternatives are about 2% of the size meat, fish and poultry. So by comparison, still very small. Um, and also we know from the Kantar data that nearly sort of three quarters of 
evening meals are still meat based so people still very much focus on the, the meat occasion um, and in Grace's slide she showed the difference between the pound per meal difference for meat versus a, a plant-based or non-meat occasion and that's where the risk is going to be um, rather than this movement to meat alternatives which are more expensive and pound per kilo actually it's going to be people just dropping meat altogether um, so it's all about continuing to remain relevant which is everything that Nick's just been through showing how meat is high value for money versatile tasty um, and everything that underpins our our marketing great thank you Beck. Um, we've had a question come in about food service. Um, so, Grace, I think you covered that in the food service market, you believe the kind of the middle channels are going to be the ones that are hardest hit. Um, so a question about which uh, red meat or protein do you think is going to suffer most from this, this kind of channel dynamics? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, what, yeah, we are seeing that squeeze the middle and it is really um, those uh, we saw the sandwiches, the major bolts doing particularly badly. And that's because people are going to the office less and so they're grabbing less of that food on the go. Um, so uh, pork is the most reliant on this food to go, those ham sandwiches that we spoke about. So maybe people making their own at home is really going to have an impact um, on people not picking them up as part of a meal deal. And um, things like sausage rolls as well, um, particularly reliant on that um, food to go aspect. So pork is really going to be the one that's the most impacted because we are still seeing growth coming through from takeaways as well, where beef does quite well in terms of burgers, especially those quick service restaurants. Um, um, and then also lamb as well, um, the kebabs still um, having come quite positive impacts compared to where we were before COVID. So pork is really going to be that one that's squeezed in the middle, even if it is a slightly um, cheaper option. Great, thank you. We've had a lot of comments about um, how people are going to be cooking at home and the opportunity with recipe inspirations, with slow cooking, air fryers, toasty makers, etc., which is um, which is really um, interesting to see. Um, we've got a question here about um, the price point of lamb, obviously it being the highest, um, and do we expect consumption to fall dramatically? Um, so I'll probably pass that over to either Grace or Beck, but um, just to flag that um, AHDB do agri-market outlooks um, biannually, um, and you can find our latest agri-market outlook on, on our website, which looks at total demand and how that is um, balancing across retail and food service, um, and what our predictions for, for the remainder of the year. So that's probably a good place to start. But um, Beck or Grace, did you have anything you wanted to add um, specifically on lamb from the lamb outlook? Uh, yeah, I can go. It's um, obviously cost is going to be a massive risk to lamb. And we have got that longer term picture for lamb of declining consumption and an older demographic as well that consume uh, consume lamb. So I think all the things that Grace just mentioned around takeaways as well, there's been some really positive figures there for lamb over the past few years related to Indian curries and also kebabs. And we've been talking about things like creating your own fakeaways at home. So it's about people thinking more frequently about lamb and how they can recreate that out of home occasion at home because it's all about that reframing versus other parts of the market where people can save money and perhaps utilizing cheaper cuts as well so perhaps lamb mince over a joint and there's plenty of recipes on the website that nick just went through on the simply beef and lamb um, utilizing some of those cheaper options within the protein as well Great, thank you. Um, and you've mentioned Nick there. We've actually got a, a marketing question, which I'll, I'll pass on to you, Nick, um, which is about what um, is AHGB doing in terms of encouraging younger consumers um, to red meat? We've actually got um, a, a new pilot campaign um, running in January actually because um, we we appreciate that our younger consumers have actually um, liked all the advertising we've done before but haven't necessarily responded in the way that the family audience have and haven't um, gone on to purchase um, in the same way so we're we've um, researched the sort of channels and the messages that really motivate young people and we have a dedicated campaign that starts in January um, that focuses um, 
on what what really appeals to them so i don't i'm going to put it out now it's probably not going to appeal to the majority of people in the audience but we have researched it and it's going to be um hopefully very exciting there's a couple of strands to it so i'm not going to give everything away because it's just in the in the process at the moment but one will be a sort of very much sort of foodie inspiration um strand and the other one will be more about fact based and really trying to get across to to the younger consumers who probably don't know quite so much about pork that it's um a healthy nutritious it's a source of b12 so um, watch this space um, for January. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here about um, a bit more about block butter. Um, so how do we foresee spreadable to measure up against block butter with consumers um, kind of going going forward? So I know you covered um, current performance of that, but have you got any um, predictions um, for the future on on those categories. Should I do it on? Um, so yeah, I think it's all about that price point. Um, so we do see when the um, margin between um, spreadable and uh, margarine increases compared to butter, butter, um, then we do see people switching um, to those cheaper options. Um, so it's all around how that plays out. We know that um, there are increases in um, the cost of oils as well. So margarine is still being impacted as well by those increases in things like sunflower oil. Um, so it's all about how that um, will play out. People are doing less baking. Um, I think people got baking fatigue from um, the pandemic. Um, so maybe there is that less, slightly less opportunity for, um, for butter in that as well um, but maybe if people are worried about the cost um, maybe instead of buying that cake from the supermarket they might potentially be making some more of it at home so it is a difficult one to try and predict great thank you we have got a few questions about how um demand and and volumes are gonna what we predict for those um and i probably will kind of just reiterate again about the agri-market outlooks where you can find our specific specific numbers um which takes into account what we predict is going to happen in terms of volumes in retail and obviously we've spoken about the fact that for pork and poultry um this might be um quite positive or, or quite stable versus um, pre-COVID. Um, but then we also take into account volumes in food service as well um, to give you a kind of total um, volume estimate. Um, so that is available on our website um, and we'll make sure that we can flag that to you um, in any follow-up emails as well. Um, so in terms of questions, I think that's probably about it. And I did promise that um, you would have an extra five minutes at the end to to ha have a drink before your, your next team meeting. So I'm going to close there and thank you everyone for attending today's session. And also thank you very much to, to the speakers. And we hope you found that useful. Um, and just a reminder, if you could complete the feedback form, then you will have access to, to the slides. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day.